Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to the continuing story of Pensacola, Florida, the North America's first place city. In these episodes, we have been we are talking about the evolution of city government here. And in, ep in chapter number one or episode number one, we revealed how the government actually got started with the arrival of Andrew Jackson in 1821, the establishment of our of a charter for the city of Pensacola, uh, the the naming of the first city council, uh, the first ordinances that were passed, and then we we passed briefly through the story of the initial economic development here with the coming of the Navy, uh, the forts that were to protect the Navy Yard, the attempts to make the uh, the first railroad north out of Pensacola, the establishment, and then the failure of the first bank, and then of course our coming into the into the uh, National Union as a state in the in the middle 1840s. Things progressed about the same through the through the early part of the of the 1850s, uh, but then in the latter part of that that uh, that decade, uh, the the idea of railroad fever uh, again infected Pensacola. And the same man, Colonel uh, William Chase, along with other investors and bondholders uh, from the city of Pensacola, invested in the beginning of the Alabama and Florida Railroad, which was to run from the docks at Pensacola up to what was then called Pollard Junction in southern Alabama. And the work began, the actual construction began in 1856. And of course, in, in the last few years of that decade, the tempers and, and feelings rose to fever pitch across the country on the issues of tariffs, uh, slavery and states' rights. And so as we approach, approached 1860 and the, the presidential election, everyone here, like everyone across the country, was, was on the edge of their chairs wondering what was going to happen. And of course, when Mr. Lincoln did uh, win his election uh, as the president, uh, Florida very quickly followed uh, two other states, and we became the third state in the, of the Union to secede. Now, when that happened, of course, uh, the state of Florida itself, the, the legislature, uh, revised the state constitution to uh, comply with the, uh, the association with a new national body, the Confederate States of America. But Pensacola itself stayed basically the same. There was no change in the charter. Uh, the same type of aldermanic government continued on here. And through the next few months, which of course were the, the months in which secession actually took place and war began, uh, Pensacola itself was relatively calm. Nothing, nothing of any great interest happened. There were a couple of little battles here, which we've discussed in other chapters. But basically, when we reached the, the spring of 1860, uh, Pensacola suddenly was in a state of crisis because now the roughly 6,000 troops uh, under the Southern Command were to be withdrawn, and Pensacola itself was to be left without defenders, and of course uh, that meant that there was to be a military occupation by the Federals. Well, everyone in the community began to pl make plans to flee, to get to go to some place of refuge in Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and this included our city council. They, did, they were, didn't quite know what to do, but they finally agreed among themselves that they would ask the governor for permission to become a council in exile. And the governor, probably not wondering uh, what in the world they were thinking about, but nonetheless, he gave his approval. And so uh, on a given day, on the ninth day of, uh, of May, the council left along with their families and they, they retreated to Greenville, Alabama, where they remained for the balance of the war. And the story that we have is that they continued to conduct city business on a regular basis all through the next three and a half years. Now, what they did, uh, we don't know there because there are no minutes reflected. One thing that is of interest, however, is that before they left, they wanted to safeguard all the records that had preceded the, uh, these dates. And so they, they went to their, their council uh, clerk, uh, Mr. De La Rua, and Mr. De La Rua agreed that he would stay. He wouldn't flee, and he was to be paid $100 a month to safeguard the records. And what the story goes on, uh, what he did was to get some large earthenware jars, safely put the, the records in there, and he buried the jars, and they, were, they remained safely there until the war was over, and people began to return. And when the, the council receded itself, Mr. De La Rua proudly presented the, the jars to them, and the council fulfilled its obligation to pay him the $100 a month that he was due. Of course, they, this is 1865, well into the, uh, the summer of that year, and they paid him in Confederate money. And of course, the, there are members of that family that still joke about that up to today. Well, the council came back. And when they returned, they discovered, first of all, that the government house in which they had uh, had their headquarters up for the first 40 years had burned. Uh, we, we don't know why or how, but it did. It was gone. And the council now had to, to find a, a, a substitute headquarters. And so they, they uh, elected to rent 
uh, stores, or actually buildings above, uh, rooms above stores on South Palafox Street, and that became City Hall. Now remember, we're, we're talking about the, the late 1860s, and that now became our City Hall and would remain so for over 40 years. Uh, they put the, uh, the city alarm bell up on the top, and uh, as, uh, as they uh, went back into action, the city government began to function just as it had in the past, except, of course, that they, during the first few years of the uh, post-war period, they were dealing with a great absence of money. Uh, people didn't have money, and consequently they had to deal in script, as did the county commission, but they did proceed. Well, Good things began to happen to Pensacola almost, uh, almost immediately. Uh, we were very different than the balance of the South. Because first of all, people came together, and this included uh, members of the city council, and they agreed that we had to try to rebuild the railroad, which had been destroyed when the Confederate troops withdrew. And so uh, new bonds were sold, a new arrangement was made, and a tie-in was made with the, uh, the fledgling Louisville and Nashville railroad system, and construction began late in 1869, and by the middle of 1870, a new railroad now called the Alabama Floor, excuse me, the Pensacola and Louisville had been constructed between here and Flomaton Junction, and we were able to uh, make have passengers and freight begin to make passage with that before. Now, this, this is not the story, of course, of local economics, but rather of government. But we want to make comment, of course, that beginning in that very year, 1870, this entire area was blessed by having the beginnings of a great traffic in lumber going from here to uh, Western Europe. <clears throat> the lumbering era had begun. At that same time, uh, in the same, same identical year, the commercial fishing business began because now we, we had the fish, of course, that had always been there. Then we had an entrepreneur with the proper vessels to do the work. And by good, great uh, good fortune, uh, commercial ice now was being manufactured here so that a man named Sewell Cobb could begin the ice business. And all of these things of course, created a new economy, and that made things a, a great deal better for, for the city council. Now, as all of this happened, and uh, as the economy f uh, flourished, downtown Pensacola began to change. It had been a, a just a primitive uh, waterfront s settlement over the entire first 40 years, but now new buildings were erected. Uh, the arrangements were made, first of all, to take care of this flood of new people that began to come in here who were going to be working in fishing and in lumbering and all the other uh, new economic functions here. And as a result of that, in the, over these next few years in the 1870s, the city council was very busy helping people get the proper uh, uh, funding, helping get them uh, the proper chartering and so forth to erect uh, new hotels, many new boarding houses, and of course all of the, the private businesses that went with it. And the city step by step by step began to grow. We, we had come to, in 1870, almost, almost 4,000 people within city limits. And uh, by the time we reached uh, uh, the next, uh, next census period, that would of course would be 1880, that number had jumped up to almost 10 10,000 people. Now you can imagine there was tremendous uh, pressure on people to, to do things to, to accommodate this, this flow. And it is now you see all kinds of, of different kinds of enterprises beginning to arrive here. This, this is when you have more, more uh, restaurants, you have more uh, wholesalers, you have more grocers. All of these things are growing and, of course, creating a, a, new, uh, a new opportunity for, for city government to be effective. Now, step by step, the council did that. And they, they were very careful. They were very, the councilmen were very conservative. Uh, and, and things, they just did a, I think we would say, a good job, except uh, as we move into the, into the 18th, 1880s, business was so good that it was very difficult for people like the police department to, to maintain a good team because the jobs were plentiful and uh, the, the, of course the, the city was not paying very much for this. And so we began to have problems of crime and, uh, uh, and punishment that went with it. The city had, of course, the city still had its own marshal, had a, had a number of other uh, paid policemen, but things were not going too well in that regard. The, the uh, area of fire protection was being handled by volunteer fire companies. Uh, there were, by the time we get into the middle 1880s, there were half a dozen such companies, and all of these were manned by, by men of by many of the men of substance in the community. Their wives were the ones that put on the bake sales and the bingo parties to uh, earn money to uh, provide the equipment that they needed. But they had a great problem. 
By the time we middle, reached the middle of the 1880s, Pensacola was g getting larger and they were, we were building, we're taking advantage of downtown property, building things very close together. And as a consequence, fires were breaking out frequently and without a water system, which of course we did not have at that point, people, the, putting out the fires was difficult. The, the city, for its part, maintained a fire protection system by maintaining uh, large buckets of water, large barrels of water along the main streets. And of course, when a fire broke out, the uh, city alarm bell on top of city City Hall would ring, the volunteer firemen would converge, they would put one end of their hose in the, in the fire bucket or fire barrel and pump away and everything worked just fine as long as the water held out, which uh, frequently it did not. And so the, the local newspaper, the Gazette, and then some of the others that were being printed at the same time, they had a kind of a joke here. They said, well, we were, what, was the, what is going to be the fire of the week this week? Because the fire damage was bad and of course, as that happened, insurance rates downtown were rising. This was a great concern to a lot of the oncoming businessmen. So in the early part of 1884, a group of men led by a man named B.R. Pitt, Benjamin Pitt, who was in the building materials business. He had uh, what, we, what we later would call Pitt Slip, a, a building materials headquarters uh, right on the waterfront. Mr. Pitt put together a, a finance group and they installed a private water system all along the streets downtown. And of course, its primary reason was not to serve homes and businesses, but rather to be able to put a water supply to fire hydrants. Well, uh, you can, one can imagine what happened as soon as that water was known to be there. People in the, in the residences, people in uh, in the business community wanted that fire, that water inside their house or house or businesses, and they, they began to make the connections. So by the time we get into the year 1885, we are now seeing water available in houses. Uh, prior to that time, uh, it had been water had been drawn from private wells, and they were still utilizing the main old spring on the west side of the city. Well, when they had, of course, once water was available, and water was being pumped into the houses, uh, there was an obvious uh, secondary uh, cause that had to be met because if you put water in, some water has to come out. And so at this point, the city council passed a small bond issue, or sold a small bond issue, and so installed the first sewer lines that we had within the city. Now these lines, of course, attached to the houses and the, and the businesses. They, they connected to larger mains, and the sewage that was collected ran right straight to the south and entered the bay at two points, uh, basically at the foot of 9th Avenue and about a foot of uh, what we today call De Villiers Street, and that's where the sewage went. It was not treated. There was no treatment plant. That was the sewage system beginning in 1885, and that's the way the system pretty much continued to operate up until the middle of the 1930s. Now, at the same time as water and sewage were being installed, other utility uh, actions were being taken as well, and these were private. Number one, by now the city was growing very rapidly, and people were having trouble getting back and forth. And it was at this time that a, a man by the name of Conrad Kupfrian, along with two fellow stockholders, put together uh, the financing plan and with the permission of the city council, had a franchise to create a streetcar system, which they did. The first cars ran from uh, down on the waterfront at Jefferson and Main, uh, ran up Palafox Street and then east to the, uh, to the railroad depot. And that was the first leg of the system. Later, this would be much enlarged so that the streetcars covered a great deal of the lower Pensacola area. And they were the, they, we might say today, not only were they a great convenience, but without the streetcars, it is doubtful that Pensacola could have expanded nearly as much as was happening. Now, at the same time, in the early 1880s, uh, people were making money, lots of money. And of course, in this time and day, what, what did they spend money on? Of course, they had, there were practically no taxes. Everything was tax-free. And a lot of these people were having money. They, they, they couldn't buy a new Cadillac every year. They couldn't fly, take the Concorde to Europe. So be, beginning in the early part of the 1880s, the city of Pensacola and its councilmen began to recognize a whole new chapter in life because people began to build new homes. And it is then that you see the, the great development of areas what, such as we call uh, North Hill today and just a little bit later than that, the, the area in East Hill. And these, of course, were the beautiful new homes that were being built uh, of the Queen Anne style and some of the other uh, very fashionable uh, uh, architectural designs. And that was when the whole, what we would say, call, we would call the new era of housing in Pensacola began. And of course, all of it accompanied the idea of water, sewage, transportation. And so Pensacola was now approaching 1885.